Hello, everyone, and welcome to Paula's Soapbox Live. I have a very special guest on tonight. You may recognize her from Capital, One Life to Live, Guiding Lights, Passions, General Hospital. <laughs> oh, my God. She can currently be seen in the Emmy-nominated web series, Tainted Dreams. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show, Tanya Walker. Oh, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you for coming on, Tanya. I'm so glad that we finally got to do this. Me too. And I've got so much family from the South. I love hearing your accent. It makes me Oh, so thank you. <laughs> Most people so can happy. tell where I'm from right, right away as soon as I open my mouth. That's just love it. I love that. So this is Throwback Thursday. So I want to I want to take it to sure 1980. Enough. Oh, my God. You were competing. You competed. I didn't know this about you, but you competed in uh, the Miss USA pageant. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you finished I was a semi finalist what? down there. Yeah, you were in the top twelve. Yeah, I was in. Uh, I came in sixth. We were in Biloxi, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and I met Richard Klein there. And Richard Klein was he played Larry on Three's Company. Yeah, for those him. who were born. Yeah. Then. Um, and uh, the day after the pageant, there were two happy people in the lobby of the Royal D'Abreville Hotel. And everybody else was pretty miserable and it was raining so badly that none of us could leave. So the two happy people were Sean Weatherly and her mother. And um, she won. And then everybody <laughs> else was just miserable watching the rain, going, when are we going to get to go home? All the flights were canceled. So I got to have lunch with Richard and that's how I got started in LA. He introduced me to his manager and I came out for a two week vacation and I never left. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's yeah. one thing I didn't find in my research. Yeah. So that's when you were discovered. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Wow. So had yeah, you been fun. doing uh, pageants like your whole life from? No, no. I, I was on a, I went to Johns Hopkins for creative writing when I was 14. They chose me out of 14 people out of 2,500 based on test scores. Um, to be studied by the creative writing department and then the psychology department and then the English people kept it on. I was on an education track. Wow. Um, I loved politics. I was a singer in a band and I knew I wanted to be an actress. I mean, I told Richard that, but I wanted to go to New York because I'd been there before and it was close to my mother and my dad and uh, we were in Baltimore, you know. So it was a beautiful place to, to go to and he's like, nope, you're a California girl. I said, I'm not a California girl. I'm a Maryland girl. And I go to New York all the time. Yeah. And uh, he said, no, you really need to go out there. So when I got home, I had a few phone calls from um, people through my pageant director that had seen me on television. And uh, my dad said, why don't you call that Richard Klein and uh, check these people out? And I said, he's not going to call me back, daddy. He's not going to call me back. So um, I called Richard Klein at the Three's Company office. And he called me back. Wow. And it was incredible. So uh, he said, I'd already talked to his manager about me, that the people that had called were kind of maybe not, maybe they're a little sleazy, but why don't I come out and meet his manager? So I talked to him and then I got a national commercial the first week I was here. I got a pilot for a television series the second week and I was here, second week I was here. Um, the film I got the, the next week was um, with Matt Dillon and it was called Liar's Moon. And I just kept calling mom and telling her I'm going to be there, but I'm coming home, but I'm, it's going to be another week or another two weeks or, well, in Texas, we had to go there for five weeks and then I'll be home because I came out in June um, and I never, never went back. Wow. That's yeah. So amazing. Yeah, it is. Um, so what got you into doing the pageants? Since you My were neighbor, I had ju the, the judge's wife, we call her um, Winnie DeWaters. She was um, the late uh, Edward DeWater's wife, and she um, had submitted me without me knowing about it. And I'd received a, like an envelope in the mail with a letter in it saying you've been accepted. And this was to the Teen All-American pageant, the Miss Maryland Teenager pageant. So you've been accepted as a, as a contestant. I'm like, I didn't enter. How can I be accepted as a contestant, you know? Yeah. And um, so then my parents said, well, this might be a way for you to stand out from the crowd. You know, it might be a way to get your foot in the door. So I did that one and I was 16. Then I came in second runner up. And then 
the next year they asked me if I'd come back. So I did and I won and I won the whole nation, the whole national pageant. So then the Miss Maryland people wanted me in that one. And so the rest is history. It was really fun. Yeah, A lot of hard work, really hard work. I, I would imagine it was a lot of yeah. hard work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump ahead a few decades. You produced a film yeah, called yeah. The, the Derby Stallion. Yeah, I did. This was Zach Efron's first leading film role, right? Yeah, it was. Um, I, when I married my husband, after knowing him six months, I thought he knew that I needed to live in L.A. or New York. <laughs> I just thought everybody had known that. And I thought it had come up in conversation. I guess it didn't. So um, he said, I, we have to be in Cleveland. I'm like, Cleveland? Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just kidding, right? Turns out it's a lovely town. It's a wonderful place. But I had been raised in Ohio until I was about 10 years old. And as a, as a little kid, mom would take me to theater and I would like, you know, wait for the star's car, especially Barbara Eden. I was waiting for Barbara Eden's limo to come out. And I wanted to talk to her and tell her I knew what she was doing and she was so good and I was going to do that and all that stuff. And the limo just went right down the road without stopping. I met her later on in life and told her oh. that I was waiting for her and I'd sent her letters and hadn't heard from her. And so she said, I'm so sorry. And she signed a picture of me, which was really, really nice. It's like a ghost going back and forth. And oh, that's my husband. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we ended up moving to Ohio, but um, he was kind enough to realize I needed a place in New York or I was going to go stir crazy. Yeah. So I did. And we also got a place in Florida because I couldn't stand the cold weather. And um, and I still wasn't busy enough. They would call me back to one life to live. But I just I just felt like this huge part of me was dying, you know. Yeah. So um, I thought, well, I'll do a movie. I'll produce a film. So. That's when I started looking for scripts. I was also really tired of watching cartoons. Nothing, nothing wrong with animated, but I had two little girls and all we could take them to see was cartoons. cartoons. Yeah. So I wanted a family oriented film that would, you know, that would be good for them that they would like. And so I found this film and, um, and I worked with this fellow named Kevin Summerfield and we, um, I bought it, you know, I bought it from him and his girlfriend. And so I produced this movie. And uh, when we cast the, the boys, because it's the group of boys, um, there was a kid on a show called Summerland. He had yeah. a small part on Summerland. Yeah, I remember that show. And I really wanted to see him. And when he came in, um, that was it. That was it. So we cast the other boys around him, which I thought was a really interesting um, place for me to sit. As, a, as an actress, now I'm a producer and I'm giving people jobs and I want to tell everybody that's an actor, <laughs> it doesn't really have a whole hell of a lot to do with your talent. Yeah. Um, everybody's good, pretty much. And I had a five foot six, at that time he was 16, boy with blue eyes, dark hair, blue eyes. So I couldn't have any other dark hair, blue eyed boys, no matter how good they were in that little group of boys. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times you go out and audition for something. You're like, oh, my God, why did I get it? Well, because you're not the right color hair. You're not the right color eyes or you look too much like the lead or, you you know, or you're too tall. You can't be too much taller than him. So Michael Nardelli was a perfect vi villain. And I've become friends with him over the years. And um, and then I made my little girls, his um, sisters. And I played his mother, but it was a very small role. I really wanted to be a producer. I wanted to produce it, you know. Yeah. So. Um, and then uh, Colton James, who's now an agent manager, he's a manager now. Mm -hmm. And his dad was one of my managers years and years before that. And, and we didn't know any of this stuff at all. It was really crazy. And then um, uh, Pinkston was like the most wonderful young kid. He, was, he wasn't completely grown up yet. So he was the right size to be the, you know, the, the, the I don't know, kind of the one that, that pokes at people, you know, the one that kind of gets on your nerves, but he's really cute. Yeah. Um, so it was a really cute boy. It was, it was really neat. And then Bill Cobb said he'd do it. And my old friend, Billy Moses said he'd play my husband. And 
Then we got the Indians to give us all the Indian stuff from Cleveland because my husband had been a baseball player, not my husband, but the character's husband in this in Derby yeah. Stallion. And we just had, it's just amazing how many things came together. Yeah, we well, mentioned that your daughters were in it. Yeah. When they were, they were kids. Four and uh, five. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't want them to be child actors. You didn't want them to actually participate in a movie or, or anything like that unless you were producing it, correct? You read that somewhere. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. I've, I've been around so many child actors. Um, most of the ones from daytime turn out okay. Yeah. Um, because their mothers are on the set all the time and everybody that's there is the same. And so when Hayden um, Pantieri, Pantieri, yeah. Yeah. Um, when she was on One Life to Live, she was like three, four, something like that. Yeah. Um, and her mother was just the best. And we'd sit and talk to her and, and, and Hayden just grew up just fine. You know, she, she was around all of us and we were, we were stable. We were there all the time. Yeah, but a lot of these kids they get into things too young and they make too much money too young and they go from family, family to family to family. And they're not family. Yeah. Um. So daytime, I think, is a safer place for young. It seems to be more family oriented. There's well, a lot it's of just, it's stable. You know, yeah. I, it's a lie that the shows are family. Everybody wants to think that, but just ask people that have been. Never mind. Um, yeah, but it's not always a family. You feel like they are, you know, but yeah. it's a business. It's a business. But it's the most stable group of people that you'll ever work with, and it lasts the longest. I mean, thank God General Hospital just had their 55th anniversary, you know. Yeah. So it's a better spot. Well, and and your daughter, speaking of them, they are pursuing singing and songwriting now, correct? Isabella is. Isabella is at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Mm -hmm. in Los Angeles here, um, two hours away. So yeah. I'm getting to see her a lot this, this winter. That's good. Um, yeah. And then Abriana went to Southern Methodist University. So she's starting to sound like you oh. um, <laughs> in Texas. She's down in Dallas and she really, really likes it there. Yeah. She wants to do publicity and advertising. And it's oh, not okay. because she can't sing because she's got a great voice. She's a really good actress and she's a wonderful voice, but she wants to be rich. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. She doesn't want to be like maybe lucky or you know maybe this, maybe that. She wants to have a job. She'll probably go to law school. She wants to have money. She, yeah. you know. And I've told her all her life with her taste that it would be a good idea if she did find something to do that would make her be able to pay her own bills. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy for that. She's really doing great. Both my kids are the greatest productions I've ever had. That's for sure. Well, I know that you've mentioned that since they are older, uh, that you wanted to continue on General Hospital. So has there been any news on that front about maybe bringing Olivia back? Well, I couldn't believe it when Frank called last year. I yeah. mean, I just couldn't believe it. And it didn't wasn't that I wanted to go back to General Hospital. I just wanted to go back to work. Right. And uh, I didn't know that because I'm in my 50s. I thought, you know, maybe it's too late, you know. Um, it's very scary mm -hmm. uh, when you give up something that you were really good at doing for 20 years, yeah. you know, and I didn't give it up completely, but I was on the top of the daytime game at that point yeah. and in 1997. And so to, <sighs> I did plays, I did this, I did that, but I wasn't, out there every day all the time you know with this vast audience watching me for 20 years and yeah. so I thought maybe maybe it's too late maybe I have to do something else and you know what that wouldn't be so bad and that's not a bad idea it isn't that I won't perhaps do that um, I actually have three projects that I'm developing right now um, but I just have to try and see if uh, if 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 acting is the way God wants me to go, and if not, I'm sure that producing is. I've yeah. got I've got these three great projects that are really exciting to me. I feel like they're important and that they could make a difference in the world and timely. Um, but also timely is what it is to be um, a middle aged or whatever you want to call me woman in this uh, in this particular moment in time. Because um, 
I mean, there's so many more parts that, that there never were before. Yeah. And there's a, there's a respect people are speaking out about their different um, violations against them. And, um, and I did too. I talked to a, there's a movie called rock and the couch um, mm -hmm. that Andrea Evans called and asked me if I'd like to be in. And um, so I'm, I'm in that it's a documentary uh, about things that happened in Hollywood that weren't so, weren't so fabulous, you know? Yeah. And um, I think we're all in a really nice spot for maybe the first time ever. And there's a possibility that it'll, it'll be great for this, you know, for somebody in their fifties to have important work because it was, I remember when I came off Capitol, I was 20, 25. And this was in 1985. So there you go. Tell her I'm 57. <laughs> so in 1985, um, they said, you're too old to play the ingenue and you're too young to play anybody's wife. Meaning um, that those were the parts. Wow. And the doctors and the lawyers and the, all those people were played by people that were more age appropriate to what they truly were in real life. So until um, Ally McBeal came out and these 20 somethings were representing these huge companies, like it was completely not believable that, that, that these 20 somethings were hired by these millionaire people or these huge corporations to represent them. I don't, it, it was, but it was the cutest show ever. And yeah. Callista Blockhart was brilliant. And so was everybody else on there. And, um, and so the believability factor, you know, of a, of a, of a, an attorney being, you know, even 27 to 30 to have these big cases or a surgeon to be like 27 to 30 doing open heart surgery on people, um, people of means generally, these are the characters that, that are asking for you know, this vital, important surgery and they're going to somebody that's 30. That started in, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I really could do was go back to daytime. So I went to General Hospital and I got on that show and I was so thrilled. Um, my father died in 84. I was 24. And uh, my mom said, you know, we can't support you in any way, shape or form. So you either get a job or you come home. Yeah. Um, I said, OK, OK, I get it. So I got a job. It was great. And um, I sold cars right before that. And it was, that's a funny story, but this interview is not supposed to last an hour. So um, <laughs> anyway, so that, so, so I got GH, it was supposed to be 13 weeks and it lasted four years. And when that ended, I thought it was the end of the world. And then ABC wrote a card for me on one life to live. And that turned into something extraordinary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but all the way along there, there have been these deep lows and big highs and deep lows and big highs. It hasn't been, um, a cakewalk like I sometimes make it sound I really did think it was the end of the world when when they killed me off on General Hospital and put me in a coffin yeah um, that producer had been on the show for about five minutes and <laughs> wanted to kill off like seven people and the yeah. show was on, the show was on one number one number one yeah and when that person was finished killing off these people on the show, including me, it was number seven. And I, I knew he wasn't going to last because you don't fix something that doesn't need fixed. Yeah. But thank God for Jeannie and Tony, because they came back with Gloria Monty and they brought that show back up. Yeah. But that show was already up. Yeah. You know, they'd been on before I was on. I never got to work with Jeannie until this last go round. Um, because she was on, before I was there, like in 79, I think that was the Time Magazine cover with her. And then uh, and I was working other places. And when I went there, she wasn't there. And then when I left, she came back. So it was the first time I got to work with her this last time. What a what an honor and a privilege to be able to work with her. She's yeah. just the best. You, you had seen yeah. with quite a few people on the canvas. I know. <laughs> I know. I did. Some of them were really short. The one with Jeannie was really short. but. Um, I did. They put me with everybody. It was really great. And I thought I'd be back way before now. Um, but I think they decided to do this, uh, bring Steven 
Yeah, Steve Burton. Yeah, Just bring him back and have him play the same character as Billy Miller, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and he, I think I he's think real Jason. Was, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I think all of that was um, was enough soup, enough stuff in the soup. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I don't know. Maybe I'll be back. Maybe I won't. Who knows? I still think that there's a place for Olivia Jerome on the on the canvas. Well, if you not think now, so, and a lot of other people think so, but. The network has to think so, and the writers yeah. have to think so. And and um, you know, I've been through this so many times that I'll be fine if it yeah. happens. It happens, and well, eventually, know, it it usually does. Yeah. You know, Julian's at the bar now, and Ava's preoccupied with the art gallery and with Griffin and everything. So somebody has to step up and run the Jerome Empire, and who better? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I helped. Uh, Alexis get Julian out of jail. They said yeah. that Olivia was rehabilitated. Yeah. So she's not crazy anymore, which she wasn't when she left. When she when I died on that show, what they're saying had happened is not what happened. I was totally fine and was in love with this guy named Colton. And I'd seen he'd seen all my awards and loved me anyway. And it was this huge thing. Um, we spent two weeks alone in a cabin and the audience got to see why Olivia was the way she was and why she felt the way she did and, yeah. and, and how she'd been mistreated as a child and how she never thought anybody could love her. And then this guy loves her and then she loves him and she, he convinces her to go back and do the right thing. So she confesses and gets shot in the back. That's kind of like what happened. And um, I couldn't figure out why I was still hooked up on Duke, but I wasn't going to fight it because I was really happy that they asked me back at all. And, <laughs> um, and I mentioned that to Frank and who, who I adore. And, uh, and he said, well, a lot of those people weren't born yet, so they're not going to care. Yeah. And I yeah. said, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They weren't born yet. I'll just do it. However you write it. You betcha. Yeah. So, um, because I, you know, I was just so happy to be back. Yeah. Well, it had to be so much fun to play. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Well, I came across this quote while we're on the subject of Olivia Jerome, and, and I hope that you said it. Um, it says, I didn't know I could be taken seriously as a woman until I played Olivia on General Hospital. It wasn't taken seriously as a woman. It was taken seriously as a boss, as a, as as a, a, boss. As a, as a difficult, as a, as, a, as a woman that could cut your head off. Yeah. I was afraid that when I first started that part, I'd only played ingenues. Yeah. You know, the, oh my God, he did this. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you know, kind of thing. And so now I'm playing this person that, you know, when she speaks, if people don't listen, she'll, when she says she, she's going to make you pay, she makes you pay. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid I was going to say something like, you know, you don't want me to be dis disappointed, do you? You know what happens when I get disappointed. I was waiting for the person at home or the person I was talking to just start cracking up. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought they were not going to take me seriously at all. <laughs> and um, so I went to a coach to help me with my voice and, and my inflection. And um, it was very, very helpful, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I really thought that, you know, if I say something mean and tough to somebody and I look like this, they're just going to laugh in my face. So um, they didn't. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, as we mentioned, you know, obviously you were on One Life to Live as Alex Olenoff. Um, So is it I true? I love that. Love that, that. Love that. Is it true that during your first scene on that show, people were messing up their lines and you yelled cut? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the <laughs> truth. I come from Talk the number one show on TV. <laughs> well, I came on the show. Like, I was on the number one show on the network, right? Yeah. I mean, we had, I don't know how many millions of people, millions and millions and millions, like 9 million people were watching us at the time. Maybe more. And I would frequently hear from the producer, you know, do you want to do it again? You know, um, yeah. how about we do it one more time? No notes. I thought it was perfect, but I'll give you another run at it. That's how it was when I was on GH. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on One Life to Live, my first day. And I'm with Bob Woods, who's a hoot, and this other actor that played Rafe. I can't remember his whole name. I'm sorry. And so 
Bob kind of messes up and then this other character messes up and it just kept going. And I, 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 I wasn't going to let that be my first scene on the show. So I <laughs> said, cut, you know, like, is anybody paying attention? Yeah. And the next day, Paul Roush called me into his office. Now, I have to digress a second. On the way onto the soundstage, I saw Paul with his little suitcases and briefcase walking out the front door. And I said, where are you going? Yeah. I go to my farm every Thursday. I said, but I haven't worked yet. And he goes, and we had had this really close relationship. I mean, he'd had me come in and talk to him about the character and this and the that. So I thought this was a big deal for me anyway, right? And um, so where are you going? Because I go to my farm in Vermont. I was like, well, couldn't you just wait till we shoot this first scene just to see if we're on the right track? I'm sure it'll be fine, right? So he leaves. Yeah. So the next day, he calls me up to his office and I understand you said cut yesterday. <laughs> well, if you'd been here, you would have said it too. You should have seen it. Everybody was messing up and everything. And it was my first scene from General Hospital on One Life to Live. And everybody's going to be watching. It was just going to be a mess. I didn't have a scene. I just thought, if you would have been here, you would have said cut too. <laughs> and he says, uh, actors are nice said ever. So that's <laughs> never going to happen again. You understand? Yes, sir. No problem, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> that was Vermont. <laughs> so that was that. Yeah, that was that story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but how could you? How could you keep from doing? I mean, to me, that would just be automatic. If everybody's messing up and you're trying to do yeah. a good job. Well, Carolyn I mean, Jones was on Capitol with me, and. Um, so was Marge Doucet and a lot of really wonderful, very established former movie stars. Mm -hmm. And all of us were like 20, 21, 18, 19, everybody on Capitol, a lot of the younger people were really young. And a lot of us hadn't done much, you know. Yeah. And um, Carolyn Jones said, at the end of the day, and Marge Doucet told me this too, the person that the audience is gonna blame for something not working, it's going to be you, not them. It's going to be you. So you need to take care of yourself. Yeah, you really right. do. And um, and they showed me how different ways to do that, even with my eyes. You know, how to not go like this and have a big old white egg over here, and make sure if I turn my face, I turn my face this way, so I don't have this big. You know, just different ways when you have big eyes like Carolyn and I. Um, yeah. They just told me so many things, taught me so many things. So even though I got yelled at, um, I'm still not sorry that it happened. <laughs> I don't think that it hurt anything in the long run. So in the long run, it did not. It yeah. Did not. Well, you used to have a radio show for a while called uh, Straight Talk Live with Tanya Walker. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you're not still doing that, right? No, I'd like to do that again. Yeah. Um, I was with Cox and Cumulus, so I was on terrestrial radio. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had a I started off with a little blog, blog what's it called blog talk, blog, blog talk. talk radio blog yeah talk radio. I started yeah. with that and then I decided if I'm going to do this I'm going to do this you know right because in my mind that that wasn't big enough the blog yeah. talk thing yeah so now I'm finding that people have these podcasts and all these different things that people listen to probably more then they do their regular terrestrial radio. But yeah. at the time, I just, I didn't get that. I didn't understand that. And, you know, it's my generation. We're just like, it's not real if it's not in a studio on a, in a radio, you know, the big antenna, right? Yeah. So, um, so I did, I worked for Cox and it was wonderful. And then they sold that station. So I couldn't work there anymore. And I was working with a man named Mike Raub, who was just the best, 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 best. And, uh, and he said, we're not going to have the station anymore. I think you should go work with um, a friend of mine over at Cumulus in Bridgeport. And I said, okay. So I went over there and I worked there. But they wanted me to get my own um, sponsors. Yeah. yeah. So not only did I have to write the show, 
direct the show, produce the show, book the show, do the show. I had to do all the, I had to be the person that got all the advertising for the show. Yeah. And then I had to do all the voiceovers for the advertising, which that part I liked. And it just got old, you know. I um a work person. Yeah, it was. And I'm still a mom and a husband, my husband and me and my life and kids. And yeah. it was it was too much for me. It really was. Yeah. So I really enjoyed doing it and I decided I'll do it again sometime when I don't have to do that. Um, I mean it paid for itself. I mean, I I took that was all it wasn't that I wasn't capable of selling. Um as I was, I just didn't like it. Yeah, I didn't like having to do that. As a performer, you get this thing where that's somebody else's job, and uh, I had to do every job. Yeah, and um, I really liked editing sound. That I really did like, but but it was just an awful lot of hats to have to wear. You know. Yeah, and to try to, to give a hundred percent to each one of them. Yeah. Yeah, but I got to interview Lucy Arnaz and um, Joey Pen, Joey Pants, Joey Pantoliano, yeah. and um, just some of the highlight people. Um, Governor Christine Todd Whitman. Yeah. It was really a great opportunity, and my reason for doing that was to present both sides of whatever the issue was, because I could see that everything on the news was somebody's opinion. So um, I was a mass communications and television journalism major in college, and I really felt like it was important for um, people at home to have information that was not colored with someone's slant. Yes, thank so you. If I, so if I had an environmental protection agency person on, you know, about no nuclear energy, then I'd have Governor Christine Todd Whitman on talking about why nuclear energy is safe. Yeah. And I didn't have an, I just, really made sure that whatever I put out there was not my opinion. Yeah. You know, I would ask the questions and people could make up their own mind, which is really missing today a lot. It really is. Uh, any channel, every channel, it's journalism has changed a lot over there the years. There isn't any. I don't think there is any. No. Um, you know, there's some people on these various news stations that I like, mm -hmm. but in general, their channel goes this direction. Yeah, you know, so they might be more straight down the middle, or try to be, but they're yeah, channel, yeah. And now the it's channel all is great. one way or the yeah. other. Yeah, it's really not news. It's really not. And the who, what, when, where, and why that you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to report. Yeah, that's not happening. They report the part of the who, what, when, where, and why will feed into their narrative about what they want you to think of their opinion one way or the other. Yes. And so they give all these facts that back up their opinion, but they don't give you the whole story ever on any, yeah. anywhere. And any do any network. I, I, it takes me hours and hours that I sometimes frequently don't have to, um, to read everybody. Yeah. And, and figure out what I, you know, and then C-SPAN is my favorite channel. Yeah. Because I can see what the Congress is doing. I don't have to have anybody telling me. I can watch C-SPAN and watch them do really, it. really, yeah. <laughs> my favorite thing that they do. Here's my favorite thing that they do. They've got some huge vote. This has happened twice in the past six months that I've seen. They have to make this decision or the government's going to shut down. And they have to make this decision in the next 24 hours. And so they don't come in. If you watch C-SPAN, they're not there. At two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. They come in around five, yeah. right? So that everybody's home watching them on TV, just yeah. in case they are watching them on TV. Yeah. And then they stay until like two o'clock in the morning. So they can say, Oh my God, we've been working on this all day. I'm sorry, that's not working all day. That's all not day. All day. <laughs> you get there at eight and you work until the next morning at eight. That's all night, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I just I I couldn't believe it. The last time I watched, there wasn't anybody there doing anything. There was like six or seven people, you know, pushing papers around and having a little, you know, who knows who they were, a little conversation. But nobody was working yet. Nobody was in there. Nobody was showing that they were working. Maybe they were working somewhere else. But they certainly weren't in there all day. Right. Yeah. Like, oh my God. <laughs> you know. But if you tuned in at one and there were 12 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night for the 11 o'clock news, they were all there. 
Yeah, you yeah, you would think that they'd been there all day and all night. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you they were not. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, talking about wearing so many hats, you're also involved in real estate. Well, a little bit, yeah. Little I, bit. I, had, I had to find something to do that would support my habit. Um, I'm a real estate junkie. Yeah. Uh, I'm a news junkie. I'm a real estate junkie. I <laughs> love, uh, you know, people would call me and get very, you know, invariably say, hey, what are you doing? And I'm so often would say, I'm looking at real estate. I thought you were doing the Good Morning Milwaukee show. What are you doing looking at real estate in Milwaukee? <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, yeah. just curious. I don't know. So, um, so I got my license because I love real estate. And, yeah. um, and I've helped a lot of people and I love doing that. Um, it's, it's, it, my passion is more about helping people, um, and making people happy, you know, mm -hmm. cause it really does make them happy when you find them the right house and when you sell their house quickly and get them more money and all that, that's awesome. And I love doing that, but I don't, it isn't what I was put on the earth to do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make my heart sing Yankee Doodle Dandy like, like it is when I'm on a stage. Yeah. And uh, so it's a fun job. It's a wonderful job. You got to work, you know, but I do think there's other work I can do out here that might make my heart sing a little, a little louder, but I still love real estate. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, let's talk tainted dreams. Yeah, let's. <laughs> the, the Emmy nominated two, two Emmys, two oh, nominations this so year. Cool. I'm so happy for Alicia. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm happy Very for well everybody at General Hospital. I mean, I got 26 nominations. Yeah, it's amazing. But Tainted Dreams has been, you know, nominated two years in a row. Yeah. And and the cast is so extraordinary and wonderful. And Sonia is just, you know, unbelievable. Yeah. So um, it's just a joy to be, I, I was included. I think I only did two or three shows on there um, because they were going to, they were going to put it out and then they're going to see how it did and put out the second part and see how it did to see if they're going to shoot any more. So um, I'm not, I don't know if they're going to shoot any more or not, but if they did, um, I would be in a lot of them. And so yeah. we'll see, we'll see what happens. I certainly hope so. I certainly yeah. hope so. Yeah, that would be really great. Cause really when they put it out, they put out, um, it was really one season that they put out. Yeah. And I was at the end of the one season, but they cut it in half, I think. So they put it because there were so many. Yeah. So they put them out like that. So so now if this if this part, you know, it continues to do well um, on Amazon, then I, we'll see what happens. I sure hope it does. I sure hope it does. And it would be great if they won. Yes. So, yes, it would. Really yeah, nice. very, very well deserved. You play Bobby Eek's sister on the show, yeah. right? Yes, and she's about to die. We think she's, you know, not going to make it. And so um, so I go in there and I try to get her out of a coma. And um, that was pretty, pretty beautiful. Um, and I had a nice scene with Walt Willie. But everything that I'm supposed to do that's really meaty is in the future. So, um, you know, this was like an introduction to yeah. Tina Scott. But but her her meaty stuff is is in so the future. Fast. So let's hope there is one of yes. those. That would be great. And and you know Bobby Eeks from performing, singing, <laughs> correct? Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah, I do. Um, she was on Bold and Beautiful. Um, and we've been in the same circles of of daytime television stars that sing and perform all over the place for mm -hmm. so long, you know? So, yeah. So she's been, I haven't actually ever worked with her except on Tainted Dreams and she was in a coma. In a coma. But, um, <laughs> but the, but the, the, the group of us who does, who does this musical, musical theater music thing, um, we're a pretty tight knit group and we feel like we've known each other forever. And we sort of have, you yeah. know? Well, you've done two episodes now, including Tainted Dreams. The other one was The Bay. Yeah, I just did one episode of The Bay. And and, and they were trying not to get sued. So they didn't want to call her um, Olivia Jerome or anything, right? Yeah. So, But that's who I was playing. 
it yeah yeah but it wasn't really out it wasn't there. really olivia jerome yeah but it but it but that's the character they wanted and that's the look they wanted to and it was funny they went back to my makeup from the 80s and the makeup artist tried to do my eyes with all this this um <laughs> this makeup that looked like that it was so much fun and uh, so i had big eyes and i had a hot pink leather jacket on and it was really a sexy little outfit and um and it was fun it was just short you yeah. know um but in the meantime i had shot some um for myself uh i wanted to do a talk show so i interviewed the, the late joe muscolo and yeah. josh kelly and um um just the number of people, one of the actors from the Bay. And um, and it just, it was really, it was really a beautiful, fun thing to do. So I'm gonna edit that together and uh, try to get some hosting gigs. I've also got a show that I'm putting together. Um, it's gonna make me have to fly places and interview people, but um, I'd love to tell you about it, but I just wanna make sure I actually do it first, but it's, it's really an important thing. It sounds fun. Yeah, I'm going to be flying places and interviewing real people. Yeah. About real things that happen to them. And um, and at the end of the day, it's going to give people hope at home. So that's all I can say about it right now. Well, keep keep me updated on that because I'm, I'm. I will. Like, I want to hear I will, more about that. I'm really that. excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you think that doing a uh, soap? opera on the web is different than maybe one for television aside from yeah. the money and stuff of course well, that's kind of important <laughs> yeah um there's um th it's more of a singular vision mm -hmm. the vision is is more of the producer only like yeah. in daytime you have the writers and you have the network and you have each director and you have the producers Mm -hmm. And on the web series that I've done, the, the real thread of the heart of the show comes from the producer. So that producer, even if they don't write it all, they, they have a vision for it and they get to implement their vision um, and they need to help bring that vision to life. They get to do that um, on daytime, like Frank, you know, Frank Valentini went on uh, Twitter and just couldn't say enough wonderful things about Jeannie because yeah. people were blaming Frank for letting Jeannie go to recurring status. Yeah. And they just don't realize how many other people there are involved in these choices. Yeah. There's, there's writers and direct and not bringing me back or bringing me back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he might think it's the most important thing in the whole world to do and they might not. And you know, on a, on the web, the person who creates the show that 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 person is usually the producer and usually one of the writers, and they have they have a heart, they have the heart of the show in in their in their sites and what they want to see, and they're able to create what they want to see without so much bureaucracy around them. Yeah, and so yeah. that's kind of cool if you're a producer. It's what appeals to me about it. And yeah, I think yeah. it might be what appeals to them about it, you know? So. so do you think that this is where the traditional daytime drama is probably going to the web? No, I think the traditional daytime drama is going to primetime. Have you watched primetime television yeah, in the past 10 yeah. years? Yeah. There isn't a show, I can't think of a show that's not a soap opera. Right, well, I mean, they all get their formula from- Daytime. Daytime. Yeah. Everybody's getting soap opera to death at nighttime. Even yeah. the the crime shows. Um, the only one that doesn't seem to be a serial is Law and Order. It's called yeah. a procedural show. Yeah. So you can watch that show. It has a beginning, a middle, and end, and you don't have to know what happened then to follow the next one. But most of the other ones, even the other Dick Wolf shows like Chicago Fire and Chicago Med and Chicago, everything. Yeah. Um, they they have. It's nice to have watched it the week before because you know that that uh, the sergeant's wife or or daughter 
was in love with this other guy. And so when he shows up and she has this response, you're like, oh yeah, that's the guy, you know? And you don't have to have that, but but that's what they do now, you yeah. know? And they have it kind of make sense. You can still watch them separately, but they really do have a, they do have a, like a thread that goes through the continuing, you know? Last week on Blacklist, you know, um, they don't mention that too much on Blacklist, for instance, but all those things, like, is she ever going to find out that she's her dad, that she, is she ever going to find out that, that James Bader character is, is, is Lizzie's dad? When's he going to, you know, how yeah, so yeah. be that? I mean, it's just, it's the best. Yeah. It's always been the best. It's always been the best. That's what's so funny. You know, a lot of people like to say, well, I don't, I don't watch soap operas, but they watch all the primetime stuff. <laughs> And not only is the primetime stuff very soapy material, there's a lot of former soap opera actors, daytime actors on these primetime shows. So it's like you are watching soap operas. I know. They just don't call them that. And they sell a lot more than soap now. You know, they yeah. really have huge advertising budgets and big sponsors. So Yeah. Well, I want to mention before I forget this Tainted Dreams. Um, Contest. contest yes yeah. contest going on for the fans um and i will post the link on how people can enter uh the contest i posted it on twitter but i'll put it underneath this uh video after afterwards and send it to me how they can I'll send it help. to you yeah. yeah um okay so here here it is when you enter this is what you stand to win uh this says that there are five first prize winners who will receive a signed script from a well-known soap. Uh, 10 second prize winners will win a t-shirt related to One Life to Live. I know a lot of people will want that. Uh, and five third prize, third prize winners will receive a Tainted Dreams t-shirt. So That's a lot these of are really cool, really cool prizes. So oh, and, That's good. Yeah. So I'm going to post that link up here on this, and then I'll send it to you, and I'll tweet it out again. Uh, I've been trying to retweet it, but you know, a lot of people don't see, you know, the first it's so funny. There's people that do Facebook and Instagram, but they don't do Twitter. There's people that do Twitter and they don't do Facebook and Instagram. So you kind of have to, you have to blanket I have it. I have to remember everywhere. to post it on all these places. And sometimes I forget if I'm on Twitter mm -hmm. to go back and post on Facebook. I so I need to go on Facebook after this is over with and post <laughs> on there too. Okay. And probably Instagram as well. Yeah. <laughs> Tumblr, whatever else. Uh, um, do people still do Tumblr? I don't know. I, I have my. I Instagram. hope not. I'm getting exhausted. I have, trying to thank you. I have, I have my Instagram linked to Tumblr just in case. So oh, you do. Anybody's, yeah. If anybody is on there, so you, you know, can do that. Yeah. I, you do I have that. my. Okay. See, I have my Facebook. Yes, I have my Facebook linked to Instagram and my Twitter and my Tumblr. I think that's it. I think well, that's how did you get into? How did you become a, a reporter for soap operas and a person that had a show about soap operas? I was friends with this girl who was uh, doing a web series. Um, she wanted to promote it, and she wanted somebody to interview a soap opera actress who was on her web series. And I was going to do just this, like either phone interview or send her questions through email. Her name's okay. Sharon Farrell. I don't know if you've heard of her. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I, had to I was back gonna, in. Okay. I was gonna I was gonna interview her, and um, she wanted to do it by phone. So I got on the phone with her, and she decided that she wanted to be able to see me while we were doing the interview. So Perfect. we spent a couple of hours trying to figure out how to do a Skype interview and record it, and and play it so that everybody could see it and then i discovered this format so it's been five years and i'm still doing it <laughs> so isn't that great yeah so it's i just kind of fell into it so it, it, she was like, it called you it dragged you it pulled you in you it know? pulled me in kicking and screaming because That's i wasn't great. sure that was something i wanted to do but you know she kind of encouraged me i was like no you're you're really good at this you need to keep doing this and keep uh keep getting guests on so you know i'd get one guest and then i get another and it just like i said five years later and i'm still doing it so that's wonderful 
That's wonderful. Yeah. You do a great job. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate thank it. You taking the time. I know you're incredibly busy. <laughs> got a lot of got a lot of stuff going on, but I hope that you'll come back at some point and of course tell us about your other projects that I'm sure you'll be working on down the road. So I tell people to really encourage them to to really write, do whatever you have to do to support Tainted Dreams because there'll be a lot more if people yeah. do do that. Yeah. There'll be a lot more story and um, a lot more for me and a lot more for other really really good actors out there. And yeah, the you cast can see all, so your, all of your favorites from yeah. Gary Lott and General Hospital and oh, all my Hollywood friends. And Walt Willie, and there's more and more and more and more. It's just that they, you know, this was just one little bit. So yeah. they need to get, you have more time to, to really play out some and more. And it doesn't take time. long to catch up. I mean, it's a web series, but it's not like an hour long soap opera on television. So right. it doesn't take long to catch up. So No, not at I all. Think well, I will post that link under here and then I'll send it to you as well. So okay, thanks. Keep in okay. touch. Okay. Absolutely. You too. Thank you so no much. Problem. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.